I've been wanting to make prints. I love the world of printmaking. I think it's it's a, it's a great world. The only art fair is worth going to if you're an artist. They're just so fun. There's so Print much fairs. to go see. And yeah. You go to the fancy other art fairs and they, you can hardly get anybody to talk to you. And in the print fairs, they, they're all so valuable. And so many of the people who are there are printers. Yeah. And print people are, you know, they're special. They've just got perma stains on their fingertips. <laughs> and they've got heart. Yeah. This is Plate Mark. My name is Ann Schaefer, and I am your host. I'm an independent curator specializing in prints and printmaking, and it is my great honor today to be speaking with James Siena and Katya Santibanez. They are both painters and printmakers, and I love how they think about the two intertwining. You know, the whole market doesn't work if there are no makers. And so on Plate Mark, I want to talk to as many artists as I can, as particularly, of course, the ones that are, are invested in printmaking. As you listen to Katya and James tell me about working together with Shore Publishing on several collaborative uh, woodblocks, suicide woodblocks, find out later on why James says paper is better than canvas. Paper is alive and a gift and canvas is dead. And I quote... <laughs> Before we roll, I want to relate my positionality to listeners. I identify as a cishet white woman, and I use the pronouns she, her. I record plate mark in Baltimore, Maryland, the land of the Piscataway Conoy people. Any images that we speak about on the episode are available to you over on the show notes at platemarkpodcast.com. Also, if you're watching this on YouTube, you will see the images within the video itself. The links to the Platemark YouTube channel and also links to Apple, Spotify, Google, whoever else you might get your podcasts from are also over on platemarkpodcast.com. It's all there in one place. Should you wish to support the good work of me and my colleagues here at Platemark, you can go over to platemarkpodcast.com and click the support and donate button, which is along the top menu bar on the far right. If you click the support with anchor button, you will get to a page where you can sign on to become a monthly sponsor at $5 a month. If you click the buy me a coffee button, it will take you to a page where you can make a one-time donation. It's set at the gargantuan amount of $50, but there's a little button right underneath that amount that says change amount, and you can donate whatever you feel is um, appropriate for those of us who are working our little tails off <laughs> trying to bring you great content about prints and printmaking in the art world. So do me a favor and head on over there and, and uh, help us keep the lights on. All right, buckle up. Here we go. Katya and James, it is so great to see you. Welcome to Plate Mark. It is, uh, it's been my long goal to circle back to you, James, because it's been since 2017 that we had an interview at the Baltimore Museum celebrating the print fair, the very last print fair there. And Kati, I know you were there and it was great to get to know you. But since then, prints have been a happening between the two of you. And I was dying to talk to you about this thing that seems pretty new, the, the collaboration between the two of you. And I mean, we can talk about other things also, obviously, but before we get to that, why don't you take turns and tell us your name, who you are and where you are and what you do. All right. Hello, Anne. Um, my name is Katia Santibanez and while well, I'm seeing myself as an artist, I make paintings, drawings and printmaking. A lot of print that have been, uh, that I have been exploring since 2004, something like that. Well, these past four years, or maybe five or six now, I make my own prints and also collaborate, well, with printmakers. But now, since five years or six now, we've been making uh, prints with James. We've made uh, four so far, and um, it's not it's not over. <laughs> 
And uh, well, right now we are in Odessa, Massachusetts. We spent some time also in New York, uh, in Manhattan. It's a good uh, combination between the two places, the city and the countryside. Yeah, I was in New York for a short time after college, and by the end of my two and a half years there, I I needed some green in the worst way. So I appreciate the Otis part of your lives. <laughs> All right, James, your turn. James Sienna, Sienna with one N, which was the bane of my childhood existence because the goddamn see how no I'm going to curse you know <laughs> it's the really okay. Benny and Smith. Crayon set had two kinds of sienna, burnt and raw, and it was with two ends. And so for the rest of my life, I've been dogged by the, my misspelled name, which, of course, for artists is a kind of destroys one's brand or contaminates one's brand. But it's funny. I remember telling a friend who's now a friend, um, who I won't, I won't name her, but she said, what's your name? And I said, James Sienna. She said, that's totally crazy. An artist named Sienna? Like, that would be my name would be Anne Cadmium. <laughs> so that's a hint. Her first name is Anne. Okay. But I'm, I'm, I too, I'm a, I consider myself a visual artist. I studied printmaking and photography, actually, at Cornell in the 70s. And I was very fortunate to work with some really good printmakers way back in the day. People like Steve Pileski, who ran the Chiron Press in New York for a long time recently died, I think last year. And Arnold Singer, who allegedly taught Titania Grossman about lithography when she wanted to start ULAE. Now, both of them are gone, so they can't verify that. Uh, but I was a, you know, I was a kind of scruffy little renegade printmaker at Cornell who refused to work with zinc. I thought zinc was built beneath me. So I've made my own batches of Dutch mordant and bought roofer's copper because Jim Dine used roofer's copper and it was cheaper. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, and I made a lot of etchings and engravings, actually. I got into engraving in, in college, which I continued to do uh, after a, a brief hiatus of 16 years between graduating Cornell and starting to make prints with master printers. The first collaboration with master printers was with Felix Harlan and Carol Weaver of Harlan and Weaver, who happened to be three doors down from me on the fifth floor of 83 Canal Street. Still are. And Felix is carrying on and Carol is no longer with us, but, um, and Felix and Katya now work together and I have a plate from Felix that he gave me two and a half years ago that I haven't worked on yet, but it's in the, it, it's, it's going to happen. It takes um, time for things to cook in your brain. I just got involved in a lot of painting since the pandemic began. I've had two solo shows, neither of which I attended. And those were painting shows. So I spent a lot of time on that. I'm eager to get back to printmaking. Uh, although we, we did, uh, we did our first collaboration before the pandemic. It was finished in 2018. Is that right? I think so, yeah. Uh, that was two <clears throat> years. And then we started in 2020, the new collaboration, which took another two years. Yeah, I think we started in 2020 during the pandemic. At some point, nothing happened for six months because of the pandemic. And then, you know, things started again and... Uh, I mean, it's a long process. I mean, well, reduction, reduction is a is a process that involves printing the whole edition every time that you cut. So you can't just cut proof and go back and cut some more. You got to wait till it, everything's printed, which was fine with us. I mean, it gave us a lot of time to think between moves. You know, it's a, it's a very strategic uh, process. But so we should start at the beginning. These are prints that you produced with May Shore at Shore Publishing, and they're reduction linoleum, wood, no, reduction wood, wood. 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 Okay, yeah. reduction wood cuts, and the rules. Well, at the beginning, what we did, we did work on two different blocks. So I started the block A, and James started the block B, uh, which I chose 
I think I chose the color for the block and James chose the first color for the other block. And then... But we proofed those two blocks we, uncut first. Right. So we just printed a flat. Yeah. And so then, that was first move. And then we exchanged the block. And then I carved one block. You carved block B and I carved block A. Yes. And then we go to uh, Tuxedo, New York to meet with May. And we, I chose the color for his, your block. Mm -hmm. And then you chose the color for my block. And then we, May printed the whole edition. And then she was mailing us the blocks. And then we worked, and then we exchanged the blocks. And she always put a little post-it and, you know, with a little heart. And this one is for Katya, this one is for James. And, <laughs> and a joke. She always put a yeah, joke in the package. Did you hear about the restaurant on the moon? Great food. No atmosphere. <laughs> <laughs> that was me. Um, <laughs> I can't remember any of the other ones. Yeah, and... Uh, so we did that until, uh, well, until we couldn't cut the block anymore. And uh, well, uh, I don't know about that. We just well, at some point you can't go further because there's the, not enough block. There's not enough block. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we spent some when we go to when we went to May to the shop. Um, Sometimes we could choose. I mean, the color was sometimes very difficult to find, to find the right color. So sometimes we spent like three hours to find the color. But then sometimes. Well, because the person who makes the person who chooses the color hasn't seen the block in its present state, because we would hide the blocks from each other while we cut. So then you, the block is revealed, and you have to choose the color for the block you didn't cut. What, but was there, I mean, is it really an exquisite corpse or was there some strategy on sort of the color scheme overall mm -hmm. from the top or was it really ran, as random mm -hmm. as it sounds? I think we'd call it, re I would say it was reactive. Okay. Yeah, because we had to, every time we had to react to, I mean, the other colors and... Yeah, and with the cut, it was the same, like react to the cut. Well, one of the funny things about reduction is the less you cut, the more you interfere with the person before you, at least in terms of color. So if you say you cut nothing and you give the block to the other person, they can choose a color. They can just wipe out your entire color. Right. And you've, you've destroyed their previous move. We never did that. Yeah. <laughs> but, but we, you know... It's interesting how influential you can be on the outcome of the print, even if you cut less. Because you make you may make a really crucial move that divides the surface into two, or you know, any number of tricks. I mean, um, and you end up with a with a kind of consequential move that's not necess didn't necessarily involve a lot of cutting. Although we ended up doing an enormous amount of cutting. And you were right, at least about one of them, I think. Um, that was which right. one? Triple barb. In triple barb, there was not much block left to cut. Right. We just kept reducing the surface till there were just these little slivers. And, and of course, the last color was really critical. It was a dark blue, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever throw in a chartreuse or something that was just to throw the other person off? I mean, I don't know that there was a chartreuse in one of the prints, but do you know what I mean? Did you ever sort of try and trip the other person up? Not really. I mean, I think I always try to respect James, you know, like in, I, yeah, I didn't try to put him in a difficult position. Well, I would say we did try to Maybe. surprise each other. Yeah. Sometimes we do a move in the cutting that was, that would really radically change the the structure of the of the image, and then if then and then of course that would call for the color to be somewhat surprising. I mean, the first reduction block I did with Ruth Lingen, I think in 1999, was just six printings of varying shades of red, going from light to dark. So we started with these little tiny holes. And the whole print was done with 
pink, then I widened the hole, darker pink, widened the hole, darker, 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 darker. So they were these kind of concavities that were the illusion of concavity. That's a pretty obvious way to use reduction. It's, you know. So whose idea was it, the, the collaborative Not reduction? Yet. I, started. I, yeah, I, I had the idea. I mean, we were in, in Spain, in Barcelona, and we were making our own prints, like with? James with Polygrapha. And I think it was in 2000, and well, we went in 12. I had the broken we, wrist. I remember I worked with my left hand. Did we go back after, or I can't remember. I went, and then we both went. First, yeah. I went and made eight prints, and then they invited you, and then I tagged along, and I made two prints, and you made eight prints. And we were riding high with Polygrapha, and they were all excited, and she, she, she said, we want to make some collaboration. They said, oh, whatever you want. And then sometimes in the print world, whatever you want doesn't really mean whatever you want. <laughs> So little by little, they said, well, we don't really know. I'm not sure. We don't think we could sell them. Oh, what? Really? Yeah. And so we, yeah. And so we. Yeah. Um, and then I approached We talked May, to May because we both I, worked with yeah. May in the past. And May said, sure, it's a great idea. Let's do it. And yeah. And yeah. So I love to, when I see Jose, I say, hey, those collaborative prints we're making with May, they're almost sold out, some of them. One is sold out almost, like yeah, there's so. one or two left, yeah. So we'll see. I mean, I'm supposed to go back to Polygrapha next year, so we'll see if I can rub it in a little more. There you go. <laughs> yeah, May, May came down to the first Baltimore uh, Fine Art Print Fair, which is not the same as the one at the museum. It's a, a whole new commercial fair. I can't tell you how many people were like, I want that one. I don't know how many she sold of your collaborative prints, but my and friend Judy one. Katz, yeah. yeah, there was tons of them. My friend Judy Katz yeah. has one in her living room. I'm like, yes, all right. Who does? <laughs> my friend Judy Katz, who was a volunteer in the print department, um, oh, okay. and who actually asked you a question about how you see color during our conversation oh. on stage. <sighs> Yeah, my she always, lines talk, my little yeah, she always has a question, thing. and so yeah, she bought the one that's sort of like a like a target, the blast one. Huh. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's, yeah. that's that's the earlier collaborative forehand yeah. choke. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's something about colors and working with James. Well, because you're colorblind. And I'm, I'm, I'm not. I mean, everybody sees colors differently. So when he chooses a color, or um, I'm looking at the color, I'm like, are you really sure? Like, <laughs> because he doesn't see what I'm seeing, and it's. I mean, it's it's fun to do. It's but it's very interesting too because I would. Like I would not choose the color that he's choosing. You know, it's just like, and I have I. I, I can't really say, no, no, we're not. I mean, uh, maybe with the, the most recent print, I think at some point I chose a color and you say, no, 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 this is not good. Um, so we, you know, we keep working on the color and then we we agreed on the on the color. But, but it's, 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 it's very uh, challenging and interesting. Yeah. Well, yeah, I managed to, Use color, even though, I mean, you know, whenever I bring that up in a, in a slide lecture or something, afterwards, people start pointing at things. What color is that? What color is that? What color is that? You know, and as if I don't see color at all. Or This morning, we were, after our morning swim, Katya said, see that red leaf with the yellow spots on it? I said, I couldn't see it at all. It was, oh. And she said, I'll show you the photo I took on my phone. And I saw it immediately. What? Yeah. It, Wait a minute. How is that possible? Well, it was isolated. I didn't have all the influence of other colors around. What? Um, yeah, it was very strange. Yeah, because I and, could and, see. And because a photograph renders color differently than reality does. Holy cow. Um, it was a really beautiful, very dark red leaf with these weird kind of fungal blooms of yellow on it. Um, which, you know, when she was pointing out the leaf in the water, I, I was looking at another leaf and I was saying, that looks green to me. I don't see any yellow spots. And then she pointed out the other leaf, which I couldn't see at all. Hmm. 
uh, context. I think it's partly context. Um, but the the it, lens must do something. It, yeah, as you say, you see the, the color. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's nuts. Maybe that's how they do those co- those. Aren't there glasses that people have made that color correct for you? That must have yes. something, something the same technology or something. Maybe I I huh. was tempted to try those glasses, but in the end, I kind of, I guess I chickened out. I thought of what if I, what if what if things look that much different? I mean, I, I might just my encounter with reality would be so different. So how how. You spent the pandemic, I assume, in Massachusetts. Did did yeah, the pandemic mostly. trigger a change for either of you? Like it changed something for me, which led to starting this podcast. Um, and it was really sort of a light a fire under me kind of a thing. But I'm curious, some people, you know, obviously lots of people died and lots of people are in grief. But was there some something that changed for you guys in the pandemic? Well, at the beginning... Well, I had the studio in New York City that actually I was preparing to leave. So when we came here in March, the Friday the 13th, <laughs> I, mean, I was not freaking out about the pandemic, actually, for some reason. Um, I never really did, but I was ready to pack my studio. So I was freaking out because... I had to pay my rent and then pack my studio. And I thought, oh, how long are we going to stay in Odessa? Well, maybe just a month or two and we'll be fine. And then, you know, um, so uh, it, it worked out at the end. Well, we went, uh, to, we, went to, we went to the Bronx at the end of April. So we were only in, New, if, if, uh, we were only in Otis for six weeks. Then we went down in a really dangerous time and masked up and got her out of there so she didn't have to pay more rent. Because, you know, not only did the pandemic hit, but finances got all screwy and we just wanted to isolate uh, our expenses and just hunker down. Yeah. And then it just got worse and worse because the tsunami just got more and more intense so we we even didn't have the materials we thought we needed to to work up here so we were just kind of scavenging and i made watercolors for a while oh wow uh and katya found some scraps of canvas and stapled them to the wall she didn't have any stretchers so she made the paintings and then stretched them later after we we order our stretchers uh to be delivered so we got we got the shipment of stretchers and, and got to work because I had a show in the fall in San Francisco. So we we got a lot of work done. Um, yeah, I mean... Yeah, got a lot of work done. Yeah, I mean, we were supposed to go to France. Um, you know, my, some members of my family, my father is still alive. And um, so on, on this... About that, it changed the way I've seen, like relationship with my family and my father because I haven't seen him since three years now. We haven't gone back to France. We will in the fall. Maybe that's something that changed. Uh, I don't know if it it didn't change much for my own work. Uh, I mean, I was focusing, but then... I don't think I was distracted by the fact of the pandemic. and um, well, I mean, You were, you were dis- pretty obsessed, though. It wasn't like you were ignoring it. You were taking notes every day on Andrew Cuomo's... Oh, I was reading. ...briefings. Yeah. And she well, had I was... I, I was yeah. And numbers. And, yeah, because so we I... we were very engaged and, of course, politically engaged as yeah, well and got involved in yeah. postcard writing for the Georgia election. And, oh, did you? Yeah, we wrote about a 1,000 postcards. And uh, apparently it worked. <laughs> it was all you two. <laughs> Just because yeah. of us, yeah. yeah. And about 50,000 other people who sent something like 20 million postcards. It was Is that actually right? quite oh, a, I never heard the a number. huge grassroots campaign. Right. Um, no, in, in terms of, you know, I mean, I wanted to know from the New York Times or the French newspaper that I read every day, I wanted to be informed because there were so many lies that we were getting so I wanted 
to have the truth or trying to find the truth. So that's something I really focused on. But I have to say, you know, like, like this year, I mean, the Ukraine war has also, for me, I think it has more impact on myself than maybe the pandemic because well, you're, I'm you're, from you're Europe, European, yeah. you know. Um, so I, I worried about that maybe it, more than the pandemic. Sure. It feels pretty close, right? It's next yeah. door, really. Yeah. 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 James, did anything sort of light a fire under you? Well, I, those watercolors really led to a bunch of new things. I started a different way of generating paintings and the paintings, you know, the, the new large paintings I'd been making since 20, what, 16, 17, were very much kind of figural. They had a kind of outer contour where all the all the generative lines went from out to outside to inside. And I changed my strategy to generate images. Um, but I don't know that that would have, would not have, I don't know that that would have been any different because of the pandemic. I mean, I'm always making new permutations on things. But I didn't make as many prints as yeah. I usually do. I made one benefit print for mm-hmm. artists hit, struck by the pandemic with Alison Samuel Pegasus Press, her and uh, Emily McElreed. And, and we priced it super low, so $450, a nice size silk screen, sold a bunch of those. And uh, and I made a lithograph in collaboration with Michael Woolworth in Paris without leaving Otis. <laughs> so I just FedExed him Mylars, and he FedExed me proofs. And, and it was actually a, a giant edition of 200 prints that my gallery in Paris was sending out to all their collectors as a kind of New Year's card. Oh. The French don't send out Christmas cards. They send out New Year's cards. Right. And they invited me to do the print that year. And they said, you know, we'll just print it offset. And I said, wait a minute, let me call Michael Woolworth and see if we can. And he printed them for something like, you know, $10 each. And he boxed them all up in a little wooden crate and sent all 200 and, I guess, 25. I got 25 artist proofs. I mean, they're a little like this. But a serious little print that really related to the watercolors. So the watercolors ended up influencing the new paintings. And I'm now hoping to make some new lithographs that, that are larger, you know, than the one I did with, with Woolworth. That involve a kind of rigorous logic, but a more what's the word, a little more capricious aqueousness. Because I was working in kind of, I was working wet into wet, but shape by shape. So I would wet a shape and then drop color into the shape. And it would make a lot of sense to do that in lithography. And now I've been actually doing paintings where I wet the shape, but on a vertical surface. Then I actually apply color and it bleeds and it, doesn't drip. I've worked it out so that it actually can move around in the sh- inside each individual shape, but not, but not drip. I'm not into the drips. <laughs> Too tricky. Too fun. When you said you, you'd never left your house to make the lithographs and you were making images on mylars, what, what, that, what does he, wait, how does that work? He takes the mylars and then what? Photo Makes exposes photo them? Plate. Yeah. Photo okay. plate. Yeah. And he actually exposed the plate four times, so he could do four. He could print four at a time. <laughs> you know, he just oh, wow. Yeah, he just masked. You know, yeah. masked it out, print, 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 expose, four expose, and lined them all up. And somehow he was able to register. And oh wow! And he cranked it out. And uh, and I got lots of lovely emails from people on his mailing list saying, "Well, this is a little better than a New Year's card." <laughs> But it was really fun. I mean, I love small things. I, you know, you know, I, I like making small paintings for years and small compressed things. And uh, so this was kind of in line with that. It was fun to actually. I like when some when a print is that small. I like the signature to be tiny as well. So I was signing and numbering really small as well. That so was fun. But I do miss printmaking, and I. I I can't wait to get back into it. Do you both, uh, I assume that print shops will approach you and say, hey, do you want to come make something? But do you, do you go the other way? Do you say, hey, Larissa, I'm ready to 
come out to Long Island and make something with ULAE or do you, how do you, how do you schedule your time like that? Like uh, July is print month or. Yeah. The, uh, well, the past year I, I've done a lot of prints with different print maker, but they, um, I, I never approached them. So they came to me. Well, the schedule is sometimes, I mean, you, you need a lot of patience because they work with other artists. So they have to schedule other artists. And like, for example, I started two prints with Holland and Weaver. It was a year ago. We did uh, two prints, two images that we finished because it was a commission. But then we kept the images, the same images and added some color. So one is finished, but the other one is still not finished. So I wait until Felix calls me and say, hey, you can come. And, you know, I mean, I've been making prints with uh, Tony Kirk also, and we've done two prints. And also we started a year ago. Those are finished. And then we did another print with an etching and I was thinking to do a, to hand color it with watercolor. So, but I had to wait until he finishes. It's a lot of like back and forth and then wait until, oh, he's teaching and he's working with some other person. So sometimes I have to wait for like three or four months until he's ready and... But it's fine because I do other things. So I, I schedule my time also. And I mean, I started a project also with uh, Dieu Donné. And I mean, this has been going on since 2020, it's November 2020. It's not finished because then there was a pandemic. I couldn't work from orders. Like I needed to go in the shop and put my hand in the pulp and... It, for me, it's, and I believe for every printmaker, it's very important to be in the shop with the printmaker. Like I can't, I mean, I can cut like we did with May, but then I need to be with her or I need to be in the shop to have questions or I need to be there with them. Like we have a conversation. Sometimes we talk about other things. Well, we worked with May you know, she would send us the blocks, but we always brought the block back to her. We could never remotely proof and do colors. So we'd spend the whole day there usually. It's a long, long day. About a three-hour drive each way. Oh, gosh. Yeah, really yeah. Three hours? Lunch. And... From here to Tuxedo. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, you know, we'd go down the rabbit hole, and the initial color, we'd be sure, oh, I'm sure it's going to be yellow. And you look at it and go, oh, my God, not yellow. What are we going to do? <laughs> you know? And so, you know, that, but that there's was, no, there are no trial proof color trials of the whole no, thing because no, you had no, to no. decide as you were going. Yeah, it was yeah. Exactly. And right. we never, we never, we, when we only sacrificed one whole proof it, if it was off Reggie or something like that, because, you know, we she'd start with 40 and end up with 30 anyway. Right, right just from technical stuff. But in terms of new prints, actually, Phil Sanders approached me. Uh, I worked with him at Flying Horse. He was a kind of contract hired gun down there. And we made some wonderful watercolor monoprints that he had a lot to do with. He, he suggested the paper. He suggested the technique. And I'd wanted to do some blocks using laser cutting. So I made these ink drawings that were then laser cut and and now he's given me these weird parallel rule engraving tools that I haven't tried yet that, oh. were, used, that were used to retouch photogravures. And uh, he thought that they would somehow apply, and I haven't, you know, as soon as I finish the bookshelves, I'll start turning my attention <laughs> back to, to, the, to, the, to the studio. But, um, but I also said, you know, how about these reticulated aqueous lithographs and he was all for it because he's a very good lithographer yeah yeah so he can get that pretty much no problem and i haven't i uh i haven't worked with him since you since when he was at ulae so okay so well that was a long time ago wow yeah yeah <laughs> yeah did, 
how it goes. Yeah, no, it's true. Phil's a special breed, which is, you know, talented in the studio and with his hands, but also a historian and also a big picture thinker about the whole, you know, ecosystem. And I, I, I never tire of talking to him because I always, he always makes something coalesce for me that hadn't been <laughs> all together, you know, like, yeah, I do that, Phil. <laughs> he wears a lot of hats. Yeah. yeah. I think this will involve going down to North Carolina at some point. Right? So uh, that'll be interesting. Well, when you do go down to see him, he's in Asheville, right? Yeah, he's in Asheville. Right. Yeah. Mm. The other person who's in Asheville, who I'm not sure, well, you probably worked with him, is Bill Hall, from who used to oh, be yeah. the printer at Pace. Yeah, he's he and Sarah retired down to Asheville. Oh, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is he, is he working still? Well, he does his own work. He's um, he's showing with a gallery there called Momentum Gallery. And oh. um, yeah, I don't think he has a press set up, but he has, I think he probably has access to Phil's press, to tell you the truth. Oh, uh, okay. They seem yeah, to I heard that you did, a, you did one of these with him, didn't you? I did. It was just dropped a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah, we had a nice conversation. Yeah, he was the first etcher I ever worked with who actually liked to cut the block down to size after I had done all my work really yeah so he he put a border on the plate and i work inside that border huh. my work is really about the edge right I mean, the, you know, the edge is super important and then he would put it in the plate cutter and get it just for you know hmm. it was it was pretty interesting technique never occurred to me as you talked about on the episode with me he obviously knew what he was doing but that he honed all of his skills under aldo chromalink's watchful right. eye yeah, and he said that Kremlin wouldn't ever criticize or anything. You know, you were just supposed to glean it by osmosis, by watching Aldo work, and that <clears throat> the whole pace shop was built around Aldo's working style. And, yeah, so that's probably an Aldo thing, I would guess. Hmm. Oh, interesting. So one yeah. degree of separation. I never worked with Aldo, but I guess right. that's as close as I got. Yeah. We printed, on, we printed on his press. Yeah, I'm sure you did. Yeah, the powered one. Oh, that uh, pace yeah. Grace. And now Sarah Lauren Carpenter is there? Is, is that still, is she still there? Yeah, Sarah Carpenter it took the sort of Intaglio area on, and um, right. Justin Israels, I think, is doing the relief. Oh, and sometimes so Ruth comes in to help, and then Yasu is doing, you know, what Yasu yeah. does best. No, Sarah's there because of me. She was an intern in my shop. All right. And then I said, I think I told Dick Solomon, just talk to her. <laughs> you don't have to hire her. Just go talk to her. And he hired her on the spot. Oh, yeah. She's, I like Sarah. She's great. How did you guys meet? We met at a party on Canal Street. That's right. In 1992 or 91, somewhere around there. No, 93, I think. 93. Because I came to the States in 1990. So, 93. 93. Okay. And Katya, what brought you to the States? Oh, I came to the States. Uh, well, the, I came here uh, in 19... I had two trips. 1987, uh, I came to New York. Well, first I went to Haiti. And during the same trip, it was Haiti and New York City. Two extreme places. I was a student in art school in Paris. So I went back to New Paris and finished uh, the art school. But I always thought I have to go back to New York. I mean, this is too good over there. So I was in Paris and I had a boyfriend. And we came together for two weeks in 1990. It was in the summer. He was not an artist. And I just finished the art school. And we met some French people in New York City, working in restaurants, in French restaurants. And uh, we met one guy and he said, oh, well, if you should come back and have an experience in New York City. So, so that's what we did. I came to New York with the boyfriend and we thought, well, I'm just going to stay here for two years or three and, and then go back to France. And, uh, well, things... <laughs> Uh, well, different. <laughs> I'm still here. <laughs> yeah, so it was just at the beginning, just for an ex, you know, just an experience. You know. Did you mean for an experiment or an experience? Both. 
Because <laughs> the French word for experiment is experience. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Both. Both. Okay. Yeah. Well, because you, I'm yeah. still experimenting. You're both. You're French and you're American. <laughs> still experimenting, so. actually. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> this and, surprises every day. And so at this party, you spied each other across the room, and that was the end of that? Oh, yeah, that party, yeah. I had a French friend who was working in a French restaurant in New York City called Raoul's. I believe it's still open. I'm not yeah, sure. Irina, was it? Irina, oh, yeah. Okay. And she said, oh, you know, I have a friend. He's an artist. And he's having a little party this Saturday. We should come. You should come with me because you might meet other artists. I knew a few artists, but not that many. And uh, I said, okay. And when I went, it was a very small party. There were like maybe <laughs> six people. Oh, it was a setup. <laughs> and uh, yeah, James was there. I don't think it was a setup. It was just no. It was no. I'm, it was yeah. an old friend who I had. I had actually found him this up uh, this studio, and it was just two blocks from my studio at eighty three, where you know I was with Felix and Carol, and I was for thirty years until a couple of years ago. And I didn't want to go to the party. I thought, ah, I'm tired. I don't want to go. But I had this, and I'm not, I don't believe in any, you know, mumbo jumbo, but I do distinctly remembering. I think I may meet somebody from France there. No. It's really weird. Yeah. I, and I said, I should go. I might meet somebody from France. <laughs> and then in walked these two gorgeous women. I had a crush on both of them, actually, but <laughs> you, you were, she wasn't available. Her boyfriend was there. And uh, and it turned out Katya lived around the corner on Forsyth. Yeah, it did look so So I, we went out for lunch. We went to this little cafeteria-type place, Malaysian Chinese. Yeah. That had, you got three items for $3. <laughs> One of the items was rice. You got two other items, and, and I, we had... Um, my usual lunch was I was kind of macrobiotic vegetarian chain smoker, really logical, very logical diet. Yeah, scotch on the side. Tobacco, right? yeah. <laughs> Had to make up for all the, the lack of protein or something. <laughs> but I, I, my daily lunch was the rice with the watercress with the fermented bean cake paste. No, we, we had also the little And then the fried... little fish, fried fish with yeah. peanuts. That oh. was the protein. Huh. And then. And I thought, wow, she likes this. I like her. You know, she's actually eating this. <laughs> wow. Watercress fuyi, fuyi sauce is what it's called. It's really one of the, if you see it in the stores, you think, oh my God, this looks like three month old blue cheese suspended <laughs> in glycerin or something. But it makes a delicious flavor on wow. greens. Yeah. Huh. And to this day, we eat greens every day. So, and we ate a lot of watercress over the years. Well, in New York City, in Odis, you can't find watercress. Oh, <laughs> yeah, right. The watercress in Chinatown is yeah ubiquitous. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> we like our watercress. But I that's feel like, how it worked, yeah. Yeah, I feel like your work. I feel like they're they're cousins to each other. There's a there's a they have an affinity for each other. And was that true in the beginning, or do you feel like you've sort of grown? cross paths and intertwined artistically? Uh, no, I, I think that since the beginning, there was already some connections. And, and well, when, when we met, she was making paintings of roots. And pine cones. And pine cones. And I actually had a mathematician friend who was extolling the Fibonacci qualities of pine cones. So you know this. You're nodding with knowledge. <laughs> well, yeah, Every, I just watched yeah. our tape together, and we talked about the Fibonacci. Oh, really? Okay, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so that I, every time we talk, I just say the same thing, right? No, it is not. <laughs> a certain number of spirals, and if you look at the base of a pine cone, you can count the spirals, and they're always on the Fibonacci sequence. They're either three, five, eight, or eleven, I think, something like that. I mean, three, five, eight, or thirteen. And and roots, of course, are networks. And my work has had to do with networks and circuits and, you know, machine-like imagery. But I, I think we've learned from each other a lot. And um, Yeah, and we're still connect. I mean, I'm still connected. I don't, you know, I don't look at pine cones anymore, but then I looked at roots and trees. And, and now I'm into spirals. I mean, the spirals started almost 10 years ago. 
um, with snails, when we spent some time on this French island, and we stayed there for three or four months, that was the beginning of the spiral. And so I think our work is, I mean, totally in, uh, connected. I feel like, I know James hates the word pattern, but I feel like there's this, there's a human need for order in some way. And it feels like pattern, even if it degrades off because your hand is, you know, unable to keep the square or whatever the pattern is, that there's something sort of uh, elementally satisfying about it somehow to me. I don't know. I, I love a pattern. I love a spiral. Like I love both of your work. So maybe that's, that's where we can start, but I, I feel like it's a human need order. It's a human need. Yeah. Well, I, I like the word procedure a lot. I like the, the, the idea of carrying out a procedure and then a, a kind of order or a kind of ordered disorder emerges from that procedure. So oftentimes I don't know what's going to result. That's why this collaboration was so fun because neither of us knew what was going to happen. I guess that's the case in most artworks, but it's not performance in the sense that we're trying to do it right. You know, I love what um, what Woody Allen said about sports. He said, sports is a, is a performance where neither the audience nor the performers know what's going to happen. Oh, interesting. And they try to influence what happens. You know, you hit a home run in the last strike of the game and everything changes. Or you strike out and everything changes. And so there is a certain gameness, both in our collaborations and in our individual procedural work you know when i when i make a decision on a painting say i've started with red and the next pass will be a say a blue pass and if i go to green or if i go to brown or if i go to white i mean it's a, it makes a huge huge difference and i really can't go back i mean i when i painted an enamel i could go back and in printmaking if you're not doing the suicide method you can go back or you can just cut another block or make another plate. But in painting, it's pretty high stakes. So there's a lot of thinking that goes on, a lot of kind of conceptualizing. But it's in the heat of the moment. It's not like I don't sit around thinking like, oh, this next painting is going to have these six colors and this sequence. And in the new aqueous paintings, there are many more passes than I thought I would do. I thought I'd do maybe two passes and they ended up taking forever because I said, oh, that's not quite enough. Now I have to put, now I did a white pass. Now I need to do a light yellow pass over the white. And yeah, there is a pattern. But the f fact that I, the problem I have the, with the word pattern is the, is the implication of repetition. Mm -hmm. And there is repetition, but there's so much variation and kind of what I call kind of cascade effects that occur. Yeah, but there's repetition and differentiation, like right. Gilles Deleuze uh, wrote about. So yeah, like now I'm I'm doing my the spiral paintings, and some of them, most of the time, like I, I've been tr um, drawing the spiral on the canvas. I'm using a transfer paper, so when I draw the spiral, uh, I draw on the transfer paper. And I can't see the drawing because the transfer paper is hiding the canvas. So it's almost like I'm a blind artist because I have to wait until I remove um, the transfer paper. You can peek, though. put a little weight on one end. Well, <laughs> yeah, but I don't want to do that because I have to, I have to work fast for the right, drawing. you were saying this morning yeah. that you, you the, yeah. that the initial it's... structure is done very quickly and then the articulation of that structure is where the time comes in yeah and and, and i like that i like this um i mean the thrill about drawing fast not seeing the drawing also until i remove the paper and there is a some kind of chaos also I mean, there's order and chaos, but I can't control anything because, I mean, first because I don't see anything or like I just go blind and I draw. And, and I think, I mean, for me also, like if there's no, 
can't really expect. I don't know what I'm going to, even if I think about the colors, there's always something that is going to change my way of um, making the painting. I can decide on the color and then I'm thinking, no, this is not working or this move is not working. And I think for me, if there was a certain order and I apply the order, it, it would be very boring. Like, I'm just like, oh, okay, there's an accident. Well, I'm going to work with the accident and, and embrace the accident and keep going. And it's going to bring something else. Yeah, it sounds like the, um, I don't even know what the word is. My brain is, I still have COVID fog. <laughs> Words, <laughs> poof, gone. Um, that, that that sort of unsure, the tension of the unsureness in your That's making it. is critical to the making. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. And there's also the challenge, you know, when you're, when you're articulating, say, uh, what you might call a soft checkerboard, if you create a, a, a tangle of lines, you can basically articulate every other shape wherever there's an intersection of two lines. But if you can't see what you're doing, sometimes the lines almost run parallel to each other. So how do you know which line, which is inside, which is outside? Where do those shapes happen? But in all of the paintings I've been doing the last five years, there have been these challenges. I'll draw out this this, the system on the canvas, and sometimes in a pretty soft marking medium. And I think, I'll never be able to articulate this. This is a total effing mess. And, uh, And then I just start into it and I usually get through it without any mistakes I mean, like I might put the color in the wrong volume once out of something like 3,000 shapes but you know that's part of the challenge it also underscores how there's a kind of underlying logic that is not individual to to either of us it's kind of a almost a universal logic where we come in is, you know, the decision to do something like that, uh, the color. You know, you were using the term experimentation or research, and I think in some of, in some ways, both of us are testing hypotheses rather than getting into, you know, emotional self-revelation, ah. things like that. I mean, okay. we're trying to create stuff that actually involves the viewer in the unpacking of the image they're not just entertained by a by a compelling and complex image but they're drawn to a kind of to be challenged to actually understand why something emerged this way i think that's part of what takes it away from repetitive pattern which is like you know the fabric of this shirt or something where you know the pattern kind of fades into the background this is where the patterns are have chaos and randomness and surprise. I think that's one way of, of looking at it. And I, I feel like we really get when we really are successful with what we do, we're actually making sure that the viewer is, is equally surprised because we don't, I don't, I don't make my work to entertain other people actually I do it because I want to see what happens you know I want to what if I do this and I I won't be able to tell what if unless I carry out the procedure and then there's some uh, some hope that other people will be catalyzed by that as well and we kind of doubled that when we worked together I mean that's part of what makes the collaboration so fun is that and we've heard over and over again, I can see you in the work, I can see her in the work, but it's neither you nor her, it's both of you, you know? <laughs> so there's this kind of third thing. It's another form of emergence, I think, because there are two strategies. It does seem to work. Well, yeah, I think it's working. <laughs> well, and then we collaborate on the titles as well. So we uh, get into these, so each of the titles has two words in it. Okay. And oh, I got to go back and look at them. <laughs> Do you feel up. like you're, you'll continue those collaborative reduction woodcuts for a while? 
um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd love to try also like etchings. Mm. Uh, I mean, and that will be different because because it's a different uh, method. Like well, we you, don't remove. I mean, it, you it's, could do well, a reduction etching. I mean, I did a reduction silk screen actually in Mosaic a couple of years ago. Yeah, I'm confused about that. How did that work? It was very tricky. I thought I would do six <laughs> printings, and we did it in three. And, and the, the silkscreen printer kind of figured it out. It's called, if you want to look it up, it's called Base 3. No, Base 2 in three colors. And actually, there's a catalog raisonné being published of my work on a new website coming out in October called Ars Publicata. Oh, nice. I can email you the link if you oh, want to put it in the notes to the show. But um, it's still being updated because all the all the data is not quite up to date. I have to fill in some information they don't have. But reduction, you could do reduction etching. It would be almost in a kind of like Krishna Reddy, uh, you know, gelatin roller viscosity Viscosity, printing. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. Um, or you could do like a mezzotinty sort of something. You could do a mezzotinty thing where you keep, right, you print with light color, then you just keep on. That would be cool. Mezzotint. Mezzotint. Yeah, mezzotint no. Multicolor uh-huh. mezzotint. I have a mezzotint plate All right. somewhere around here. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can experiment with everything. I mean, you know, it would be fun to do like a, I mean, a drawing or painting collaboration. Yeah, or set up like different rules also, maybe. Yeah, it's, it, it, we've been on the treadmill a little bit, you know. It's, you know, you know, producing work for shows and and uh, that's part of what keeps us from doing more of this kind of thing. But it'd be nice if we did get off the treadmill and, you know, I'd, I'd make a painting with you, you know. You, we said we'd look at doing that. Yeah, you know? yeah, we can. I think there's this funny idea about artists, you know, back, back in the day, I, I always imagine Matisse with his coat and tie and he, you know, draws in the morning and paints in the afternoon and it's a job. He is a worker. And then there's this weird romantic idea of, you know, divine inspiration and you're like, Oh, it's struck and I'm going to go make this thing. But, you know, as you're talking about preparing for shows, like on a treadmill, it is a job. Creativity as a job is kind of an oxymoron in my brain. Yeah. Well, it's also, it's intrinsic to our kind of work. I mean, we just don't paint fast. I wish I could. There we you go. Know? Um, <laughs> it would be a different life if I could work two hours a day or three hours a day. But if I don't work lots of hours, I don't get anything done. Well, how much, so how long does it take to do a, a, you know, one of your, I don't know what the normal size for you right now is, but I mean, how long does it take? Oh, the new paintings that were 75 by 60, they were two or three months. Oh, gosh. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, some small paintings, I can make them in three weeks, but the larger one, it's maybe two months. Wow. But it depends if I do something else. Also, like if I sometimes I work on a print, I have to stop working on a painting. So, yeah, it's, I mean, I don't, I, yeah, it's a job, but it's a flexible job. Maybe. Oh, and what's the cliche? You know, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. Right, right. So that's right. You know, what else would I do? I mean, you know, <laughs> when you work without words, you can put on a an audio book and paint. And you know, you know, we were talking about Ukraine earlier. We both listened to Timothy Snyder's Bloodlands, which is an extremely important book to today and it puts a real historical context on the war in Ukraine, talks about Stalin's abuse of the Ukrainians, Hitler's abuse of the Ukrainians, Poland's involvement with Ukraine. And it's um, highly recommended. So, you know, you're drawing on one side of the brain or another. Once a decision is made, you know, there's this kind of, I wouldn't say autopilot, but there's a kind of two brain approach to working and I think that's just a joy I mean uh, there are times in certain paintings where I, I have to work in silence it's yeah. just too weird I have to concentrate usually when I'm laying out a painting I can't listen to any words because oh, I, huh. I have to it involves certain kinds of spacing and certain types of rules having to do with how the grids are drawn 
But then once it's, then I sit maybe for an hour or two and think, what's the first color going to be? You know, I can't listen to anything then either. Um, but I like what you said about Matisse drawing in the morning and painting in the afternoon. I know a lot of people who do that. Oh, yeah? Like, yeah, I had a student who had a great practice. And when I, I'm constantly telling my own current students, would you please draw? You know, they, they, they get involved in these paintings. And I said, well, you know, you could have realized that this was the wrong idea for a painting if you just made a drawing first. <laughs> and I had a student at Yale who was a little bit older than the other students, late 30s, early 40s. And he drew for five minutes every morning. No more and no less. Oh, interesting. But he, like he said, a timer. And he had, so he had 365 drawings a, a year, at least. Sometimes he'd make two drawings in five minutes. And they were always the same size. He had these boxes, and it was like a gold mine. He could just refer to it. And you can actually get a lot done in five minutes. So I've convinced a few Except students. if you're painting one of your paintings. <laughs> no, but those, those are different kinds of drawings. Right, right. <laughs> I can make a drawing in five minutes. I have boxes of <laughs> fast drawings. You know, they they find their way into the work. But, but, you know, again, like when Katya was saying, or I was saying that Katya starts a painting with pretty rapid and random gestural drawing, that's a catalyst for them, the, the labor of what emerges from that, you know. It's akin to say, you take a photograph, well, a famous photograph of the droplet of water, taken with a high speed photo, you know, shutter and strobe, and you can see the sort of crown of water or the famous photo of the banana with the bullet going through it. Oh, right, yeah. You know, this idea of kind of paying attention to the world at a different scale and a different rate of attention is interesting. But I did decide after finishing all the paintings for the show in October, October 20th, at my <laughs> McHenry Gallery. Where's um, that? 21st Street. I don't have the address on it. No, that's okay. I just, yeah. I thought, okay, now that I've finished all the paintings, I should draw for a while. I got to remember to do that once I finish the bookshelves. Yeah. I, I paint. I can stop the painting and work on a drawing. Sometimes I work on a drawing and and I have another idea suddenly, mm. and I start another drawing. So sometimes I start like five drawings at the same time, which actually I, I, I like doing that. I mean, I can't help myself. I oh, that's very it. smart. It's like making a decision. You're on a decision tree, and, that, and then the branches on the tree keep growing, and then you can go circle back yeah. and work on each separate pathway yeah yeah but i don't do that with paintings like i would start a painting and i will finish the painting at some point hmm. um, but i don't start five paintings at the same time well don't you ever and, get stuck on a painting and you start another painting because you just don't know what to do on that painting no i will start a drawing oh yeah <laughs> i've got about three or four paintings that i started years ago and i just gave up Oh, I wonder. Every once in a while, I go back. Yeah, I've got about three enamel paintings. Mm. I pulled one out a few years ago, and I repainted the entire thing. But the color's all wrong. So it took me about two months to just repaint the whole painting. But it was a good painting at the end. It was worth it. I'd like to remember to do that now and again. Yeah. Yeah. You, you can, like, set reminders in your phone calendar, you know. Right. every other week like draw this morning <laughs> or try out the new you know yeah or go look at that painting that you exactly can't yeah, to do. yeah. <laughs> i feel like you're talking about making decisions as you're working and you have you both have a meticulousness that i i'm not sure a lot of artists have. i mean i'm sure some do but ben levy who you guys all have met um he always talked about printmaking being every moment is a decision, you know, how big is the addition, what kind of paper, like everything forces you to consider. And in my mind and, and in my conversations with him over the years, you know, we always poo poo the painters, sorry. And <laughs> cause they're just, you know, emotionally putting stuff on them. But you guys, you guys are like printmakers mm. at heart who happen to paint. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> 
You'll take it. <laughs> I'll take it. I mean, I'm not. Thank I, you. <laughs> I think we're, well, well, I use the word procedure and printmaking is really procedural. You know, it's just, you, you got to do this and then you do that. But it's also one thing that painting is not. It's indirect. Right. So here's the print, but you had to make this to make this and mm -hmm. that. And then take another one of those on there, and then another <laughs> one, and another one, you know. And then, oh, wait, I want to change the color. I want, or I'll do this one thing, you know. So it requires a lot of strategic thinking. Uh, not always, but it can, and especially, you know, so I think our kinds of ways of thinking lend themselves to printmaking more so than they might for other so-called painters, but I don't consider myself a painter. Right. Oh. I don't have paint all over my pants. You know, I don't, I don't splash paint around. I mean, it yes, falls you're... on the floor, but it, I don't, you know, it's, I don't have this giant crusty easel, you know, and I'm wiping the paint off on, you know, it's not a, it's, it, there is materiality involved and there's materiality involved in printmaking, but it's, the materiality is very much tied to the to the ideas behind the work. Sometimes in opposition, like when I was talking about the watercolors, where you've got a very strict grid, and yet inside each cell of that grid, there's all kinds of bleeding and the reticulation, and and those two things working against each other are a lot of fun. And there's a kind of wonder to how when one thing works against the other and they still somehow manage to stay on the same level that's another thing that happens that's another kind of emergence that yeah that analogy reminds me of um something my that i think about in terms of i have a brother who's a, a musician <clears throat> excuse me and how in music it's one of the few places and you're making a, a, a case for art, which is great where you have precision math measure, everything's sure. lined up and you can get goosebumps. Yeah. You can get goosebumps. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm thinking also about like the material, the materiality of, you know, like when I make a painting, I work on, the canvas, for example, and I work with brushes. But when we make, or I make, you know, the, the prints is like, I work on a, so, a, another material, which is wood or copper. The fact that to work on, especially on wood, it's, I, I feel like I'm a sculptor almost because I'm carving. And when I start carving, I can't stop. It's, I, my mind goes into the wood and I keep cutting and cutting and I want the block to be perfect. And then the papers, that's where we, we print. We print on the paper. So there's another, um, another world beside just canvas that is, you know, used in printmaking. It's, it's very special. Like it, it doesn't happen when I make a painting. I make a painting on the canvas. Well, canvas oh, is will... canvas, but paper is... <laughs> oh, paper is paper. Yeah. Paper is like flesh. Paper is alive. You know, it's, they're, they're all cellulose. But paper is, you know, it, em it basically emits light. You know, John Yao put it very well when he talked about the difference between drawing and painting. He said, in drawing, the paper is like a gift to the artist. You know, you put a few lines on a piece of beautiful paper and you, you get them in balance and it's just transcendental. You do that to a canvas, the canvas is kind of dead. It really doesn't, you, you have to take responsibility for the whole surface in a painting, I think. I mean, you have to take responsibility for it. I mean, but the, but the, the, but the paper is a gift. Paper is a real gift. It's so the, the canvas isn't a... a, a... Participate an active player in the in the show. <laughs> or... White canvas. I mean, it can be. I mean, uh, but you have to. It, it has to be part of the idea behind the work. You know, like, I've been leaving some of the canvas or the linen exposed, but it's heavily gessoed with clear gesso, mm. so the tone of of the surface is important. And when I painted on aluminum, in all but one or two cases, I always covered the entire surface with paint. Didn't leave any metal exposed. 
but you could see the edge. You could see that it was aluminum. You could see it was metal. So it was a little nod towards materiality, but it wasn't. I liked aluminum because it was so flat and so shallow. It had a real integrity and sort of. Ben tells a, a great story in an earlier episode of Plate Mark <laughs> about um, Ben. Okay. Yeah, Ben, who co hosted season one. We, we talked about the state of the state of museums and, you know, critiques and all that stuff. And he talked about in his early days at MICA, he was with the printmaking crew. And for whatever reason, they had a, a joint critique session with the painters. Why? I'm not sure. But they were nervous because, you know, the painters in the hierarchy or up, a false hierarchy, of course. But when they got into it, the painters couldn't even explain why they started with the size that they did, where the printmakers are, you know, everything is, I did this because of this, 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 this. And the painters are just like, they couldn't even describe what their thinking was. <laughs> Which I, I thought was a great I made story. It this because I could fit it through the door. <laughs> or, or, you know, on the elevator, you know. Right. They're all, you know, yeah, there are certain considerations. Although I've had students at SVA who like, I say, why did you make that? You'll never get it out of here. I say, oh, <laughs> I didn't think of that. I brought the stretch, stretched it in my studio. You know, are you going to have to unstretch it and roll it? What? Roll it? Like how? Which? How, what, <laughs> how do I roll it? <laughs> but printmaking does force us to think. Well, it forces us to work within constraints, and we yes. always work. Every artist works within constraints. They're just more explicit when it comes to printmaking. Yeah. How big is your press bed? You know. Well, yeah. What size margins can you have, or what mm -hmm. kind of paper is available to you at your budget, or how many can you, how many sheets can you afford, and what size edition it's going to be, and right. all that. How How do you decide edition sizes? Do you Do you do that thing where? Well, no, you probably don't because you have a master printer doing it for you. But there, is, I've read somewhere that there were artists who the edition size would be however many they could accomplish in that day. So thir if it, th it was thirteen, it was thirteen. Huh. Mm. Because of a practical reason, not because, you know, they love the number 13 or whatever. No, I, I usually it's a kind of... It's around 25 or... It's usually 20, under 30. Yeah. I mean, I had, some, I had some moments where the prints runs were larger with Harlan and Weaver. Some of those engravings were very popular. So we made, you know, we said, let's do another one. We'll do 49, and, you know. Um, or if it was engraving, the great thing about engraving is that you can just beat the shit out of the plate and nothing <laughs> happens to it. It's just the V groove is the most stable line in any printmaking, you know, and the ink just pops right out. It prints beautifully. And the and those plates, I made those plates. And I worked my took us off making those plates. And so, you know, if we could get a few more prints out of it, we would. So... Uh the the series of interviews on plate mark is trying to talk to as many people who have various roles within the print as i call it ecosystem we're trying to pull back pull back the curtain in some sense but just be yeah. relevatory about um what happens in the artist's mind and what happens in the print shop and what does the publisher do and and just introduce people to what I think are the nicest people in the art world, the print people. Because they are. Absolutely. We're the nicest people. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And we all, you know, we're all working in a, a column of the art, you know, hierarchy that's it's a little bit of the underdog. And we all support each other and try to make, you know, try to get the word out. So that's why we're doing this. Yeah, that's great. Have you yeah. talked to Jim Kempner? I talked to Jim, yeah, I talked to Jim before the Baltimore Fine Art Print Fair in, in uh, April. He was one of our vendors, so I did short interviews with as many of the vendors as I could manage. And, uh, yeah. yeah, I did have a conversation with him, and he, as you know, is hilarious. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One, at one point, he said something like, yeah, you know, sometimes people come in and they're like, yeah, I need to buy something, but I don't want to print. And he said, he said, okay, okay, sit down. Let me tell you about prints. Exactly. <laughs> I don't buy prints. I only buy originals. Right, yes. exactly. Oh, oh, there's only one 23 over 28. That's original. That's right. one 23 over 28. There's only going to be one of those. <laughs> and after all they're all gone, there's going to be no more anyway. So that's right. original. 
All right. Yeah. Please. We saw him at the uh, IPCNY benefit. The benefit, yeah. Oh, great. Okay. So it, it was after the uh, the art fair, the Baltimore art fair, yeah. Yeah. No, he's a, he's a great guy. He was a real welcoming presence. I think that, you know, they just don't need, um, they don't need billionaires. Well, and half of all billionaires are assholes. Oh. <laughs> you can leave that in. Um, I only said half. But, um, but, you know, I got into art, I think, really through, not just through comic books, which all kids do. Uh, my ambition was to be a comic book artist. I was like, yeah, you get $20 a page just to draw? What the hell? That sounds like the greatest thing in the world. <laughs> It never happened, um, but, but my father went to law school at Stanford in the 61 to 63 or 60 to 62. I was a little three-year-old when he went in, and then um, in 69, he got hired at Stanford to work for the president's office as a lawyer, and one of his old professors kind of chatted him up and said, you ought to come by, you know, my wife and I have a little hobby. We sell original prints by famous artists and they're really affordable. And, you know, just no pressure, no pun intended, but, you know, come on over and take a look. So we'd go over to John and Nancy Merriman's house and they had Hockney and Frankenthaler and Rothko and Oldenburg and Johns and Dine and, they had a Tony Smith sculpture out in the backyard. I saw all this stuff. I hated most of it. They had these great Frank Stella lithos where the image is down in the corner. And I, I now own two of those, which I could have gotten for 100 bucks each in those days, 1972. <laughs> but these were 1000 each, which was not too bad. That was kind of my gateway drug to art, actually, was looking at prints. Hmm. So when I, and actually Nathan Oliveira, who taught at Stanford, was kind enough to look at my portfolio when I was applying to schools. And he suggested I visit his friend, Jack Squire at Cornell, and who's in the sculpture department. And he would get me an interview with the chair of the art department, Kenneth Evitt. And I got in and they had a great printmaking program. They had Pileski and Arnold Singer and Phyllis Thompson in the etching department. And some grad students would come in and just do nothing but prints. And I got into all this alchemy, you know, making my Dutch mordant and getting stoned and burning through the plates. I, you know, <laughs> had a great time. And, but Merriman, the Merrimans really got it started. Hmm. It was really, and, you know, I should have saved up some money and bought a couple of prints. I mean, there were Jasper John's prints for $300. Yeah. Yeah. The, the ones that are $300,000 now. Right. <laughs> but, and my parents, they bought one Sam Francis and one Roy Lichtenstein, which I have. Oh, nice. Are, yeah. I, we haven't, we took them out of the old frames. Their frames were not good. And I remember mentioning to them the first time I spoke at, at an IPCNY benefit, I think we were, honoring Felix Harlan. And I was saying, you know, my way into Prince was through John and Nancy Merriman. And Jim Kempner started clapping. <laughs> you knew John and Nancy Merriman? Said, oh, yeah, very well. He heckled me, you know, from the audience. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that was really that was really amazing to see a house just filled. They, the first flat files I ever saw, you know, and just walls covered with framed prints from Gemini and UAE right. and everywhere else. Hmm. Yeah. Hey, it's funny you call I it the gateway to... drug because we, um, that's exactly how I marketed the print fair. Like it's, you know, the perfect gateway drug into collecting and, and it, obviously it's true. And Ke Jim, who I think had COVID during the fair, so he had a couple of people, not him, come and, you know, Jim sells on the, a lot on his charisma <laughs> So I hope they did okay. But he had a couple of um, Rausch, I mean, I think large edition, but Rauschenbergs uh, for 200 bucks. I saw several people walk out with Rauschenbergs. Great. Wow. Yeah. That's so. wonderful. I was going to talk about my experience with, I mean, print. Actually, I, I never 
You when never I studied was, it. I never studied printmaking. So I started to, in 2003, I had access to Manhattan Graphic Center in New York City. So that's when I started to make prints. Um, and you studied and, with Vijay Kumar, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, Vijay Kumar. Tony was also teaching there, but I didn't. I just uh, started with Vijay, and then also I did woodblock also with uh, oh, Takuji. Takuji. Yes, yeah. the Japanese. Uh, yeah. but, Takuji Hajima, right? Right. But when I was a student in Paris, there was a printmaking studio, but I didn't have access to it. And I've been always drawn to, I mean, at seeing shows of prints in museum since i'm six or something like that six years old i I collect stamps and i always thought that stamps i mean especially the french one they have this um connection with with printmaking i mean they are very small prints they're tiny tiny this is why i've been wanting to make prints I love the world of printmaking. I think it's it's a, it's a great world. The only art fairs worth going to, if you're an artist, they're just so fun. There's so Print much fairs. good work to see. And yeah. You go to the fancy other art fairs and they, you can hardly get anybody to talk to you. And in the print fairs, they, they're all so valuable. And so many of the people who are there are printers. Yeah. And print people are, you know... They're special. They've just got perma stains on their fingertips. <laughs> <laughs> and they've got heart. Yeah. 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 No, we're very fortunate. I mean, I, I didn't know that I would move into a building where I would meet the best etchers in New York. And, and then, if, then they would work with me. And they, they made two prints with me in 1995, and I couldn't get arrested for my art. Um, and then I guess two years later, things were different. And our first three prints that we did went to the Whitney, and that started the whole ball rolling. Yeah. Was that David Keel that bought those? It was. Or- David Keel bought the yeah. set. Yeah, I think he bought the set for $300. Because <laughs> I, I, I published that, actually. There was a publisher who bailed and got me in a lot of hot water with Felix and Carol, so I... I bought him out with a painting, which he went on to sell for an obscene amount of money. I'm sure. But I, I got, I sold it to him for seven thousand dollars. So he made quite a profit, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm happy. For him. We bought a Maserati or something. What yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So have we said all we need to? Are, are there more stories that you have in your brain, Katya, that we haven't? Not really. Okay. It was fun. Well, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for d- talking with me about prints and printmaking and all of the fine, fabulous people who live in the ecosphere because, you know, it's the best place to be in the art world, if according to me. So I appreciate your time. I really appreciate well, it. Thank you. It was fun. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Plate Mark with James and Katya. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Any images we talk about are over on the show notes at platemarkpodcast.com. And another reminder, too, that you can donate to support the good work of us over here at Platemark by going to the support and donate button on the uh, menu bar of platemarkpodcast.com. There are two options there, one for a monthly donation and one for a one-time donation. So make your, make your choice and make it happen. Next time, we are talking to Julia Samuels of Overpass Projects, a print shop near Providence, Rhode Island. She's amazing, and I think you'll be interested to hear her take on economies of color. It's really, she's really something. Also, I need to thank not only James and Katya for agreeing to talk to me about their, their work and life together, but also to Michael Diamond for the use of his original music. Okay, I think that's it. We'll see you next time.